one and I stand on that You and me, babe, that's black on black We have this question of ethics around AI and everything that we are engaging with, as I said, that we just take for granted. We don't really question it, but it is here and it's not going anywhere. So we must empower ourselves and understand it. She's also a computer scientist. Let me welcome the great Timnit Gabriel. Hi. Hi. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming. Now, pronounce your name so that I, because I know I probably didn't do it correctly. You're close. Um, it's Timnit. Timnit means Timnit. wish. And Gabriel. Gabriel. Timnit means wish in what language? Tigrinya, which is a language spoken in Eritrea and Northern Ethiopia um, region of Tigray. I imagine that that language is close to Aramaic as any language uh, on the on the earth. Yeah, it's it's very close. I think wait, Aramaic is uh, the I think original language before, you know, before, before. Because I'm because right. I mean, what I know is that, you know, uh, Ethiopia is the f- birthplace of Christianity and they have the oldest, the most pure form of Christianity practiced anywhere in the world. So I'm imagining Eritrea, which is right there. Also, there's a, like this crossover. Uh, yeah, at so that time, you know, they were all in like the, the same people. Regions. Yeah. But yeah, so um, Tigrinya is also very close to Arabic as well. OK, which is also close to Spanish because yeah. of the, like I, I just feel like we, we need to know these things. Right. Because we have, yeah. we have we've been taught to be in these silos of disconnect uh-huh. and uh-huh. to not see the thread, the common thread that sews us all together. And we can only mm-hmm. do that by being in community, but also that, you know, your history. Right. It's incumbent upon you to know where you're from and all of exactly. the, the history that comes with who you are. So thank you. I, I want to spend, before we get into the AI, I want to spend a little time you, with you talking about your journey um, to coming to the United States by way of Ireland and the war between Ethiopia and Eritrea, which is fascinating to me because I believe that Ethiopia is one of the few countries that have never been colonized by you know Europe or any place else. And so you know that battle you know, what did you know about it? Because you you were in Ethiopia, but you're Eritrean. And talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So, you know, I was born and raised in Ethiopia in the capital city. And my family um, was, you know, is from Eritrea. And they moved my mom and moved and both my parents moved to Ethiopia when it was, you know, Eritrea was like part of part of Ethiopia still. But at that time, You know, a lot of people in our family were in the guerrilla warfare or, you know, just a lot of people were involved in um, either the fight for independence or they're being persecuted or going in and out of prison, being political prisoners. And so they were um, there was a lot of fear um, because the Ethiopian government was also at the time um, like a military dictatorship. So. You know, I, one of my late cousins used to call me Nech um, Lavash and Amharic, which means um, undercover. Because <laughs> when I was little, like, uh, they were all very scared of me because they, they want, they're like, let's say they need to hide or something. And, you know, I'm just like, going around talking to everybody, like whether it's the soldiers or whoever. So like, they had to really make sure to hide information and people from me. So one of my cousins was in our place and we didn't want, you know, I guess they didn't want people to know that he was in our place because um, his friend was, uh, you know, ca- captured. He was in prison. And so this, my, my cousin was trying to get, get away and he was in our house. And um, I didn't know that he was living at our place for the longest time. And so anytime he came in, he had to pretend that he was just like visiting, <laughs> you wow. know, and stuff like that. So I never met this guy ever, even though he was, you know, and so like, um, and so when I, you know, he came to the States later on, he was like, yeah, you know, I would have wanted to take you for an ice cream or something, but you were like the scary one. We call, you know, he called you undercover, <laughs> oh, <laughs> undercover. Oh my gosh, you were going to um, get everybody yeah. got. To yeah, me. exactly. So, you know, and, um, and then, so once that happened, um, there was a, um, you know, a, a, a very brief period where there was no war because um, Eritrea got its independence and, you know, they were the Ethiopian government that later took over and the Eritrean government, they were, you know, fighting the former 
um, I guess, group together. But then what happened is then they started fighting against each other. So then everybody else sort of becomes collateral damage. We have a saying where you say, you know, I don't know if other people have the same, but we have a saying when when the elephants fight, the grass um, is the grass dies or the grass is the one that, you know, is um, is uh, harmed. Mm -hmm. So exactly. So um, so in 1998, there was a war between Ethiopia and Eritrea, and um, what happened is that the Ethiopian side started um, deporting people with any Eritrean blood, like, you know, or maybe if you're half, you might be fine, but like, you know, even if you're born and raised in Ethiopia, you would be deported to Eritrea. The Eritrean side did the same, like started doing the same to the Ethiopians. So for our case, you know, we had half of our you know, people in our family were getting deported. Um, and then, you know, you had to also join the military in Eritrea. If you um, if you are, you know, of a certain age, you have to join the military, right? And especially if it's at war times. And so it was very risky for me at the time to be deported there because then I would have to actually join the war against Ethiopia, like, you know, which happened to some of my family members. So we basically... Um, we wanted, we needed to leave. And um, my mom was super lucky because she had um, gotten a visa to the US when my sister was graduating. And it was, these things are super interesting because your life is in the hands of the person at the embassy. And this was a black man who was so proud of my mom. Like, you know, my mom uh, was going to my sister's graduation. He was so excited for her. And he was like, so proud on her behalf. And she asked for a six month visa, visa and he gave her a two year visa, which literally saved us because um, if he had just given her, you know, a six month visa, we wouldn't have been able to get out. So he gave her a two year visa. They wouldn't give me a visa because they, you know, I didn't have a visa before. And so they're like, you're, you're not going to come back. You're Eritrean. We know what's going on. So um, I tried to get a visa elsewhere. Nobody would give it to me. And then my sister, who was in Ireland at the time, just for a work trip, convinced the Irish, you know, that I was just going to be there temporarily. So they finally let me get out. And then I was there waiting for a political asylum. And, you know, and then there was a whole thing with the U.S. embassy. Like they made it super clear they didn't want me there. You know, um, they were trying so to at really... this point, Bush is president of the United States. And this was in 98. So, so this was Clinton. So this Clinton. Was, Clinton, was Clinton, Clinton was still. Was yeah. And, yeah, and so America president. didn't want so because, you know, we, we talk we're talking about immigration now. Right. And yeah. how, um, you know, people are handled from Switzerland and Sweden and Europe versus people from Haiti, Haiti, uh, people and, from Ukraine versus from, you know, Central America. Africa, versus, right. yeah, yeah, Haiti. It's, it's, it's the same issue. But back then you know, it was better, but it, it was slightly better, but it was still not good. And so, you know, when you, I think of visas as a global apartheid system, I mean, that's basically what it is, right? You are restricting people's movement and the people whose movements are restricted are obviously not white ever. They're never white, right? Um, and so, you know, I had a very visceral, um, my mother found out about my father's death when, um, when she was trying to get a visa to, to Italy to visit him, and it was just to visit him. And they literally told her at the embassy that she doesn't need to go visit him because he's dead. You know, that's how she found out. And, you know, in our culture, when you're telling someone news like that, you sit them down, you send people, you know, you don't just do that, right? And so I grew up with this very you know, this understanding of what that's like and the way they look at you, the way they size you up when you go to the embassies and stuff. I mean, you know, it's so that was that was like very, very much something I was aware of. And of course, war and immigration and all of that. And then I come to the U.S., finally get to the U.S., um, 1999, first day of school. You know, I don't know anything about the school system, whether it's, you know, AP honors, whatever, you know. So I go to my chemistry class and Mr. Torello, who I still remember, he probably doesn't remember who said stuff like this to me, but I never forget. Right. And um, I um, I'm just like listening to him talking about what they're going to cover. And I was like, oh, OK, I did this last year. So maybe, you know, I should move a level up or do something else. And I go to him. I'm like, hey, can I, do, you know go a level up or something like that. He's like, you know, I've met so many people like you who think they can come here and take the hardest classes. If you took the exams that these people take, you would fail. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I was just, 
What is going on here? Um, I guess I'm not going to take chemistry. So I just never took chemistry in high school. Um, that's it. That was my last chemistry, you know, but wow. that was just, that was a prelude to my life. That, that was basically an introduction to what was going to happen in high school. And it was such a battle just day after day. Then you get out of that. And then you go to college and they're like, oh, you're so lucky. You're so lucky. You're both black and a woman. You got in because of affirmative action. I'm like, you got to be kidding me, <laughs> you know? So that's, um, that was, that was sort of, um, yeah, that was kind but, of the but, but look, you know? <laughs> and, you know, not but because when I, when I read your resume, Team Neat uh, Gabriel is here. Uh, her name means wish, which uh, is amazing. It's also, I wish you would. Like, I feel like you got, I wish you would energy, even though your voice sounds very <laughs> angelic, but I feel like no one should b bother you because you have smoke behind that nice voice. Um, you ended up at Apple, Google, mm -hmm. like in, in high positions, you started in, as an intern and then quickly got into computer programming. And then, you know, you are a powerhouse in this industry right now. Talk about that, you know, how you got here, but more importantly for us, those of us engaging, because I feel like we make every platform that we're on amazing, That's but we right. have nothing to show for it. And, and, and here's my challenge, because as somebody that is constantly, you know, in an entrepreneurial spirit, trying to build the next thing, I'm having a hard time finding people who want to build the world that we want to live in digitally, right? Who have the yeah. skills and because everyone's looking for a check. No one's willing yeah. to do what Zuckerberg did, which was to have 10 people in a room coding in, in, a, in a college dorm. Well, he got the check, though. See, he did get the check. Talk about it. Talk about it. So, you know, I think the, the biggest issue is that people like him um, have other people um, who look, you know, who look at him and it, he reminds him of themselves younger or something like that. So after a little dinner, a little chat like we're doing here, they're like, one million dollars for you. I believe in you. Go do whatever. No, one million, 10 million, 20 million, whatever. That's what I see right now in my industry. There is so much money in it. It is so unbelievable how much money there is. And um, a lot of mediocre men mostly get a lot of money from other mediocre men in power. Um, nobody wants to invest in Black people, especially Black women. And, and that's really the issue. We have so many amazing people doing amazing things, they can barely get 1% of the funds that all of the other people get. So um, to me, you know, that's, that's the, the number one issue. And what I have tried to do is to, first of all, you know, what, what do they do? They have an echo chamber where they sort of amplify each other's voices, right? Like in, in, amplify each other's work. And so we have, you know, we have a, an organization called Black and AI that was meant to do just that, right? So we have people who, um, when I when I started out in AI, I go to in conferences like international conferences in, in in this field, like the largest conferences in the space. And you have in tw in 2016, um, there were about 6,500 or 5,500 people attendees from all over the world, and I counted five black people. One, two, three, four, five from from the world internationally, right? And so, what is it? Where is this? Where this was is this? called NIRIPS. It's it's a it's a the largest academic AI conference. Um, and so you know, wait, so, wait, so I, wait, hold on, hold on, Timmy, because you're, you you're wait, hold on, hold on, your super internet hyped up. They're talking about your your internet is going in and out, so I want to I wanted to catch up. All right. So no. there's a conference of about 6,000 people. It's an AI conference held where? Where was this? It's um, it's held in different places at different times. But in 2016, it was in Barcelona. And a total of five black people showed up. Yeah. What does that say about a the welcoming uh, nature of a conference like this? When AI is the future in 2016, they all knew that this was going to be the future, that only five people showed up. What does it say about us and what does it say about the folk at the conference that organized it to make sure that it was represented by the majority of people that you're going to need to make this thing run because you need us? 
Right. So the way they would talk about it is not that they need us or but that they need they we need to be saved by them or something like that. Right. And so at that time, they were all talking about AI like a very important part of the future um, and, you know, how it's going to save humanity, etc. Although they would never discuss issues of racism and sexism as if they're sort of above that type of mundane everyday detail. Right. That's how that's that's the vibe I was getting. But um, and so being in those spaces is so painful, like you get harassed as a woman, you get in set, you know, the racism is just incessant, incessant, right? So um, I am amazed by the people who stay, right? And so it, it's more about breaking down the barriers. And, um, and so you see when you're in these spaces, you know, at that time, I don't know if you remember the ProPublica article that talked about um, this company that uh, created a software that purported to determine um, people's likelihood of committing a crime again, right? And obviously it was biased against black people. I mean, so anybody who knows anything about, you know, US, I don't know, history and politics and whatever knows that. However, when you hear people who are in high places in, in these um, organizations in this field talk, you know why such software is created, right? So as an example, there was one guy who was, su you know, who's super high up now, um, who I was telling him about my experience with police, you know, and I was telling him this horrifying experience where I called them to help my friend and then they put handcuffs on my friend and it was a horrible thing. And his response was, well, well, you know, she must have been acting crazy. Because obviously, like, they wouldn't do that unless she's acting crazy, right? This is the norm in the field of AI. So on the one hand, you have people like that who are designing these systems, which are obviously going to be harmful to us. And then on the other hand, you have people in our community who are super excited by this space, but they don't have the investment, first of all. And secondly, even if they kind of bite the bullet and get into the space, it's too painful to stay. So they they have too many barriers to stay. And even if they stay, they don't make it, you know, as high up because they don't have the investment. If they're entrepreneurs, you know, less than 3% of VC money goes to black founders, right? Um, less than 3% of professors, right? And all of that in every dimension. And so I, I don't think it's that people in our community are not interested. I think it's that there isn't enough investment. And um, I also think that, you know, it's hard to really think big picture and aim high if that's the case, right? So when people are talking about building on top of organizations that are large, like open air or something like that, I want to encourage people to more think about having their own systems right. and companies from scratch. What would that take? Because, you know, when, when I think about building something from scratch is to me, it's skill over money, right? Like what, what do you need? If, if, if 10 people in the room come from North Carolina a and and they can code their behinds off, what do they need financially to build the next Twitter or the next chat GPT? Because we, we need to have open source AI that is culturally responsive and full of our history, right? That it can tap into the actual lived experiences of all of the Black people going back thousands of years. Like we need somebody, they went to Kenya and filled it up with the stuff that they wanted, right? They went to Kenya and filled it up with the stuff that they wanted, paid pennies on a dollar to have a trillion dollar company because that's what it's going to be worth. And then here we are, like, how were they able to do that? Was it just money, Timnit? Like um, money, network resources, security, you know, generally generational wealth. Right. So if people like I remember I met uh, one of the founders of Facebook at some cafe when I was in school and I was like, oh, what do you do? It's like, oh, I dropped out of school to work at Facebook. I'm like, wow, my parents would I, I that bleh, that was just not an option for me. I, when I was at Apple, I still had another job where I was tutoring people for one hundred dollars an hour because I was like. I can't pass up that hundred dollars an hour, even though I'm working at Apple. People have, you know, free internships, unpaid internships over the summer. A lot of people of color can't do that because they have to support right. their families. So we need that investment in people, right? Not just um, so definitely money, um, and also like a supportive community. So that's why you know Kimberly Bryant created um, Black Girls Code, right? Uh, for you, which got snatched from her. That's right. That's another whole, that's another 
whole discussion. Right, because because when you when somebody comes with the money, then they get to make the rules, right? Exactly, exactly. And so, but that but that's what I'm saying is 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 a way for you to to be in this environment and be able to bring your whole self, right? And not have to you know pretend to be who you're not, or you know be harassed all the time and deal with the the bullshit, basically. And so I think that. Number one, we need investment and we need to invest in our own communities and we need to respect um, the work of people in our own communities and hype it up, right? Like um, kind of uh, make sure that we're always um, hyping up people's work. But but the, the, the last thing is that, you know, I think it's, it's difficult for people to aim higher than working at one of these large tech companies or um, using them or something like that, right? It's difficult for people to aim higher than that and to build their own thing from scratch. And especially if you don't have this kind of investment. So I think that kind of education and why that's important is also like something that, that we need to do. What, what would it take? We, we watched uh, a petulant billionaire um, not have to sell anything to purchase uh, Twitter, which we were all engaging on. This is how I was able to engage with you uh, and drive it in, fire people, drive it into the ground. You know, maybe he's going to file bankruptcy, not sure, change the name, do whatever, because he owns it and he has complete control over something that he didn't build, couldn't imagine, doesn't know what to do with. And, you know, for for us moving forward, where do we go next? I'm like, build our own. Yeah. In the meantime, you know, holding patterns, you know, we got to we got to connect. I see your your team that uh, get brew uh, on Mastodon. I don't know anything about Mastodon. What is this yeah. Mastodon? And is that someplace that is good to go? I don't Mastodon. You know, I, I see it as an alternative that I'm building. I'm helping to, you know, try to build. But it's really it's still, you know, not a great place for black people. It's still very white. It's, uh, people still get harassed. And so, but I'm kind of holding on trying to see, okay, I can at least help make it better. So it's, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the problem is that um, it's very difficult to create our own options and it's very difficult to sustain them. But I think, but I still see it as a potential alternative. However, a lot of people are going to Blue Sky, which is created by the same guy who, you know, thought that it was the best idea for Elon Musk to take over Twitter, right? Jack Dorsey was talking about how- Oh, that's Elon his thing? Absolutely. Jack Dorsey was talking about how um, he, 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 Elon is the singular person he trusts to extend the light yeah, of- Because he was trying to get that $44 billion. He was trying to get that, that mm -hmm. coin- Okay. All right. So we got, we got, we got, we got bamboozled. We got, uh, so, so I was given a name cause I was, I invited blue sky on, uh, I was given a name of, hold on. Let me tell you, let me tell you Jay Graber, Jay oh, Graber. I'm pretty sure okay. that's, uh, that's, um, Jack Dorsey's thing, unless I'm absolutely. Uh, okay. Saying. All right. I'm, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. I'm almost 100%. Uh -oh. I can't say I'm 100%. Okay. Okay. So, so getting back to because, you know, and I, and I hope this is the beginning of a conversation because I've been I've been dancing around trying to find the people who are going to because this is not my bag. I don't code. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything mm -hmm. about it. I just know mm -hmm. what needs to be. You know, I know what we need. Right. I just there are people out there who are skillful. So I want to do two things with you, Tim. Um, I want you to identify people who should be on Tech Tuesday who are doing things because that you're right magnification of brands and people who are doing things, you know, like Dawn, Dawn Dixon, who we've had on with her, you know, and, and a few others who have benefited from being on this platform greatly. You know, I want this to be that because this audience is one of the dopest audience you will find anywhere and they're engaged and they're really super yeah. smart. Right. So have super smart people come in. I just actually was talking with Michael Harriet. He's he's got a podcast. He's like, can I screen it inside Nubia? I was like, yes, because he wants to be in community and get feedback, actual feedback. We're going to tell you the truth about your thing. Yeah. That said, I also at the same time want to build a a, a powerhouse like a, a, a like a the Avengers of coders of young people. I want them to have, you know, like I brought up North Carolina a because they're one of the best tech schools in the country. Like mm -hmm. we don't have to be, I know you went to Stanford. We don't have to be a Stanford or MIT or Harvard. We got our own schools where kids, you know, that are engaged. We'll give them a little coin, put them in a room and tell them this is what we need and put them to work. Right. Mm -hmm. And instead of always going out, trying to get a big check from Google, they got yeah. enough of our ingenuity, ingenuity and genius let's let's bring it home right mm -hmm. take a little sacrifice take a little you know but in the end you have ownership and 
I just so frustrating because it's right there. I know. So I, I think that um, the, the issue is it's not just the coding skills or the engineering skills that we need. Right. It's 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 the coding and engineering skills can only be put to the right use if you had the right framework about like the your worldview is oriented towards that. And so I think we really need those people. And there are a lot of black women who have been really at the forefront of, of the latter. So um, what we call, you know, tech and society or AI and society, whatever you want to call it, it's a science, technology and society. So Dr. Safia Noble is one. She wrote the of book. Course, of course, the- we've had her on. Yes. Yes. Ruha yes. Benjamin, she's been on frequently. Do- yes. Dr. Ruha Benjamin, you know, um, so Simone Brown, we, we, uh, what I, you know, Charlton uh, who wrote um, Black Software. So I think what is really missing in the Black community is that there is this tech sector that there is this a group of people, you know, like Nesby and Black Man, whatever, where you know, one group is trying to just bring more Black people into the space. And, and, um, black VCs who are trying to invest more in black people. And then there's another group that's trying to make sure that we, our worldview is oriented towards making sure we don't further harm that community. There needs to be much more dialogue and collaboration with those two groups. I think that's really the biggest issue, right? Because otherwise what you have is um, us like having these um, efforts to bring more black people into an exploitative industry and not change that industry. Mm, mm. That's the key, right? Um, exploitation. So before, before we go, where are we most vulnerable black people in this a- AI space? Where, where should we be putting our attentions in terms of protecting ourselves, but also where should we be putting our energies? I think, you know, there's always this consumerism thing where they know corporations know that black, they need black people to be consumers. So you see the ads, right? The advertisements and things like that, um, targeting black people when you know they don't have any black people in their leadership, right? So most recently, Sam Altman, who's the CEO of OpenAI, has been making the rounds. And I guarantee you, he might have literally one black person in his entire organization, maybe one. I know there's one that I met. I bet you there's nobody else. And he, he started his tour by going to an HBCU first. I believe, I'm not sure it was Howard, but I just remember that it was an HBCU that he decided to go to. So that means, you know, he's trying to woo, uh, uh, you know, some of uh, some of these institutions without actually hiring people or anything like that. Now, organizations mm-hmm. like his, you know, you you talked about chat GPT, you talked about, you know, if we talk about any of these generative AI systems, not only language-based, but te- text-based, image-based, et cetera, they amplify any type of stereotype that you've ever heard of or know of with respect to Black people. There's not a single um platform or product that comes out and you're like oh wow yeah like it definitely portrays black women in the best light like it's just never happened (laughs) you know and so that's one we keep on talking about it forever but their fix is always quote unquote future work right um and and it's never by the time they get to it the next thing has already um been released secondly um many of these systems are used to surveil and police black people right Mm. when you look at face recognition when you look at Many of these other um, systems, uh, you know, biometrics, they're used to surveil Black communities. That's mostly what it is. And so I think that's a that's something that everybody needs to keep an eye on. Thirdly, um, Wait, so pause are- there. When, when you say surveil, so when we give them our phone numbers and our bank accounts and we, we, you know, they use that information and they do what with it? How are they surveilling us? So even, even first, even if you don't give your uh, bank account or other information, there's face recognition systems that are used everywhere, right? So now if you are at the airport, they use your face, right? To, to do customs or other stuff. If you're walking around, if you, um, you know, if they want if, if police, can use face recognition in in some cities like San Francisco and Oakland, it's out loud. But for instance, you know, in, in many other places, police can use face recognition. So New York, I mean, we just saw the mayor do that at a at a sporting event, had facial recognition at uh, I think it was Brooklyn, uh, one of the Nets games or something. 
That's so crazy. So what what happened? Um, my call, uh, my collaborator and I wrote a paper in 2018 showing that these kinds of systems had much higher error rates, especially for darker skin women. The darker and darker the skin, the higher and higher the error rates, and no error rates for lighter skin men. Surprise, surprise. So we warned that what what this was going to mean was people were going to be mistakenly um, identified as somebody who committed a crime or something else and arrested. And that happened. The first known cases of people being arrested based on face recognition, um, the wrong identification based on face recognition are Black people. And these are people, you know, who were later exonerated, but their lives were ruined. And if you look at the kinds of things that they were arrested for, it's like, even if it was, if you, even if they were the actual um, culprits, right? It was like stealing a snack or something like that. You really want to, you know, use, spend all of this AI stuff to find someone who stole a snack, you know? And so um, I think that this is something people need to keep an eye on. And the fact is that it's not just the disparities in error rates and accuracies, but even if you have perfect face recognition system, perfect surveillance is not good right? Um, for right. over-policing. The other, the last thing that I would say is that it is preventing Black people from getting you no know, loans or other resources that they need. Um, I know there was a something that came out that said that um, Black Americans were three, to, um, three times as likely to be audited by the IRS yep. as Black Americans. And this is because of, again, some of these algorithms that are being used to determine who is more likely to, quote unquote, commit fraud, right? And so these are the day-to-day -day, um, ways in which some of these systems are harming um, our communities. And, and imagine things that people think are fun, like chat GPT. When, when you're in school, I just gave you an example of a horrible experience I had with, with, with teachers at school. My cousin is always being accused of not writing an essay herself, even before these systems. And now with these <laughs> yes. systems, so many people are being flagged as quote unquote using AI. And who is going to be much more so accused of cheating? Right. The people that you don't think are smart to begin with. Exactly. Yes. And that is yes. what we are already seeing. All right. Well, I think this is the, the beginning. We're in the middle of something, but for many of us, it's the beginning and we're not going to stop because we will not be left out, off of this boat because I think the first trillion dollar company is going to be made through AI. It should be something that we control and own because we are going to power it no matter what, because we bring all of the spices and the food and the deliciousness to everything because that's who we are. Uh, and so I'm here. So <laughs> use this platform however you need. Team Nit, and you have an uh, open seat, an open seat in, into our home. And I appreciate the work that you're doing. And please come back and let's communicate. Let's stay in, stay in community. Thank you. This was this was such a lovely conversation. And I'm looking forward to coming back again. Says that she loves me. Isn't it lovely when the one who loves things is the one?